welcome to participants as you join. If you would be kind enough to uh, put in the chat uh, where you're from and uh, your coordinates, that would be great for us to, uh, to know uh, who's participating in today's uh, discussion. Um, I can start with uh, the introductions of our host for these events, Theodora Samiotis. And for those of you who have not yet met Theodora, she is a communications and public affairs practitioner with over 25 years of experience in the private and public sectors. And uh, recently she's been assisting with uh, assisting CAP for about 18, the past 18 months or so, providing us strategic advice on advocacy and now for the uh, organization more broadly. So welcome Theodora, we're glad to have you with us. Well, thanks so much, Chris, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to welcome everybody. To, uh, to the second session in our virtual and CAPS virtual workroom series. This is the second in a series of um, four. Last week we talked about planning. Today we're talking about um, climate action through building reuse. Uh, next week we'll be um, talking about engineering and uh, the slides coming very soon. So engineering as an equalizer. And then um, finally um, the overarching slide, trades and climate will be coming up as the last discussion. Um, so, uh, in addition, and then if we just flip briefly to the four questions to the next slide, um, we see um, these are the four questions that we'll be talking about today with our participants. And, um, and while you read the questions, I will introduce the wonderful group of part three panelists that we have uh, joining us today that bring a unique set of experiences uh, to, the, to the discussion. So, uh, first off, we have Mark Chambers who was a registered architect in Alberta and British Columbia and was inducted as a fellow of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada in 2014. He's a conservation architect at Le May in Calgary. Mark's passion for architecture and conservation started young while working with his father, who was a designer and builder. He has taught at the Department of International Interior Design at Mount Royal University and in the Master of Architecture program in the Faculty of Environmental Design at the University of Calgary. He is particularly interested in contemporary uses and interventions that can coexist with historic conditions in a mutually beneficial environment. Next up, we have Eric Charon, who is an architect with a Diamond Schmidt Architects with experience in the conservation, restoration, and retrofit of heritage buildings in Ontario. Forgot to mention Newton Wave. <laughs> he is project lead of the retrofit and adaptive reuse of the historic Weston Bakery in Toronto to uh, converting it to residential use. His previous experience includes um, restoration of the dome in the Saskatchewan legislator in Regina, as well as analysis and retrofits to Queen's Park in Toronto. And finally, we have uh, Roberto Chiotti, who is founding principal of Larkin Architect Limited. In addition to his professional architecture degrees, he has a graduate degree in theology and ecology from the University of St. Michael's College at University of Toronto. Uh, Roberto is a lead accredited professional and currently serves on the CAP membership committee. His firm is engaged in the sustainable adaptive reuse of historic buildings, particularly within the religious institutional sector to assist in ensuring the long-term legacy and ongoing viability of our architectural heritage. Um, they recently completed a renovation work at, on the Church of Our Lady Immaculate in Guelph has elevated this national historic monument to basilica status and has attracted both national and provincial Heritage Awards. Gentlemen, welcome to, uh, to today's uh, panel discussion. Um, and I'm going to turn it over now to um, our uh, moderator, co-moderator, uh, Dima Cook, who is a uh, principal at Evoke Architecture, former president of CAP, longtime member of CAP, and who will be, uh, has been contributing for many years to, uh, to this whole area. And will be leading the discussion today with the assistance of Chris Uchiyama, who's the president of CAP as well. Thank you very much, Theodora. So I've asked Chris to sort of join me in moderating this session because I have a slight constraint on how much I can speak today um, and how fluent, how much words are going to get out in one breath. Um, but while I have the mic, maybe I will start by saying that um, these sessions that CAP have put together are the first of many we hope to have on this issue, which is critical that we face our society. And this can really comes about from what the um, the Climate Heritage Network is putting forward this idea that building reuse is climate action and how we as a profession and as a group can not only promote heritage as a means of conserving our culture, but also as a means of conserving our environment and our societies. So heritage is really a positive um, 
positive force for ec economic, for the system, for societal, for the health of our cities, and for the climate. Um, as heritage practitioners, I think we're all familiar with some of the key messaging that we like to say about you know, keeping our buildings. But part of this discussion, part of these advocacy sessions is really an attempt to look at how we can um, redirect and reframe some of our language, some of our communication and some of our mission um, in terms of its applicability and, um, and relevance for climate. I think that's something that's been missing from our discourse. And that's really something I look forward to hearing the discussion. So what are the opportunities we have? What are the challenges? Um, what are the challenges we have? And you know what we can do better. Um, and yeah, we are really, I think we're the stewards for our environment for the future. So I've spoken enough, so I'm going to pass it to Chris, and she will be leading the questions and having a few words. Thank you. Well, thanks, Duma. Um, maybe the best place to start our discussion today is to invite the panel to identify from your own experiences in the communities where you live and work. Um, one major issue or obstacle to improving sustainable practices in our industry. Maybe, maybe I'll start. Um, I think uh, as an architect, um, our profession is obsessed with, you know, new, beautiful, you know, differentiating our buildings from every other building. So there's already, um, we value, um, you know, kind of ego-driven, uh, form-driven, uh, new, bigger, better architecture. Um, so already that's a, uh, that's a value that, that makes it difficult for those of us engaged in heritage architecture. Uh, we're already fighting against, you know, a tendency towards differentiation through newness and bigness. And can, it's almost as though architecture has become a form of entertainment. You know, if you look at all the major architecture feeds, the zine and, you know, all these other um, uh, periodicals, they, they tend to focus on, on those buildings and less on the heritage. Just building on that, Roberto, uh, many architecture schools reinforce that, encourage that idea of newness. And I have colleagues even today who say they went to architecture school to build new buildings, not to renovate old buildings or not to be involved in heritage conservation. And while as a student, uh, I found that really frustrating because I was interested in the newness and the redevelopment, but also in the conservation of existing, um, especially when, when there was a strong heritage value there, or heritage character. And also the, the uniqueness of building the new often negated the context with, within which anything new would, would be situated. Uh, I, I was most enlightened, not in school, but mostly in travel, uh, especially to, to longer, older cultures where newness could be inserted into a, an existing, maybe heritage context with a great deal of sensitivity and respect to the adjacencies. And it wasn't this idea of iconic or uniqueness and uh, ego-driven, uh, as you commented, more respectful to what had come about decades and centuries prior to, and uh, the ability to to be become integrated and to contribute to that that area, you know, a bigger context, a streetscape or a community. Yeah, there's a that's a great point, Mark, and I would I would add to that that we see examples great examples of this type of sensitive addition to existing buildings in places like Quebec City or Montreal where there is a distinction from heritage but it's done uh, such that it's still there's still a compatibility that's in play uh, between existing buildings and and I would take this further to suggest that yes, in the next 30 years, we're going to be seeing massive uh, population increases and, and more needs for housing, like we're seeing in cities like Toronto and Vancouver. Um, but I would offer to suggest that 
80% of the building stock that is going to be around in the next 30 years already exists. And we cannot simply just replace all of it with new buildings. We have to start thinking about how to renovate, restore, and reuse everything that's already standing. And we're doing it to a small extent uh, currently, but that has to get amplified in a big way in the next decade in order to meet the challenges we're facing. Yeah, I, I learned to that point, to Eric's point, um, and then I do want to come back to something else that Mark said. Um, I learned at a recent RAIC conference that the amount of new building required to accommodate the increase in population and migration into urban centers over the next 40 years kind of requires, if you can believe it, building a city the size of Manhattan every month from now for the next 40 years. And just even if every single one of those buildings was designed to be net zero emissions operationally, just the extraction of materials, transportation, fabrication, processing, and construction of those buildings would push us over the one and a half degree, um, you know, kind of threshold. Uh, so that, you know, you, we, we have to really think about our existing building stock and how we can adaptively and creatively reuse that stock in order to meet our needs. Um, then something that Mark said, I think uh, to your point, I think the problem with heritage architecture is within our profession, it's seen as a specialty. Whereas I think, and in, in school as well, we have, if you wanna learn about heritage architecture, you go to a particular school, whether it's the Willow Bank or the program at Carleton, it should become a foundational and not accessory uh, kind of consideration in every architectural program and um, it, with every architectural association. As a mentor in the OAA, uh, I had an intern who was strictly in, interested in heritage architecture, and yet she had a problem getting all her hours you know, under different headings and different building typologies um, with the OAA and had to get sort of special dispensation for them to acknowledge mm -hmm. that heritage was a specialty worth pursuing in and of itself. I think the AAA in Alberta would, would uh, also pose similar challenges. Uh, I have a, a young colleague who is passionate about heritage conservation, and he's concerned that uh, registration might be an issue when it comes to the interview, even though he can fulfill all his requirements in terms of uh, uh, design, contract documents, administration, and so on. But uh, that uh, there are all kinds of hurdles in, in that regard. Exactly. So is it, is it, oh, sorry, Eric, you're muted. Sorry, yeah, I can certainly attest to that. Um, I spent six years working with Spencer Higgins Architect in Toronto, and I was in that same time doing my internship with the OAA, and it took longer than typical to get registered because of lack of exposure to certain areas of, of what they were requiring at that time. Um, it certainly gave me more insight, though, working for a heritage office, uh, that specializes in conservation and preservation into the various building science elements that you need to know in order to restore and upgrade heritage buildings that a lot of people just don't know, whether you're a homeowner or potentially a contractor that just focuses on new builds. Right, and it's something Edward Masria uh, reinforced in terms of sustainability. He made the comment that every architecture school could very readily and very easily implement at the very first design studio that every building should, must be um, energy neutral, zero carbon, whatever parameters that if that's introduced as a one of the many parameters in a design project, it will be achieved. I mean, students want to achieve this, architects want to achieve this. So if, uh, and the same with associations, if they prioritize issues like this, it can be implemented in a very short period of time. But the, the will has to be there, whether it's the political will or the spiritual will uh, to implement these ideas. 
Yeah, I think my, my um, critique of the current uh, conversation on sustainability is that we continue to remain focused on making small incremental improvements to what are ultimately uh, dysfunctional methods of um, you know, uh, construction and process and um, in, which enables us, I think it's almost conscious that it enables us to defer indefinitely the transformational change required to bring about a viable human presence on the planet and a, and a future worth inheriting for our children. And I think, um, you know, that's, that, that really needs to shift. So to your point, Mark, you know, we have to start with every building being carbon neutral or, you know, zero, not only zero emissions, but try to reduce our embodied carbon, you know, substantially. And one of the best ways we can do that is to retrofit and keep existing buildings, which already have all that carbon embodied, right? Absolutely. Feels like we're, we're uh, veering into uh, one of the other questions that we have, which is, you know, as, as architects, what is it that you need in order to better fight climate change? What is, what is it that we need to, to really spur this change? Well, I'll jump on that one. Uh, back in 2005, I worked with John Straub in the development of the building envelope course for the Alberta Association of Architects in Alberta. And one of my main goals was to demonstrate different means of achieving the goal with becoming more sustainable, becoming energy neutral, becoming zero carbon. Um, and a big part of it was in retrofitting existing buildings. And I, look, I looked at it from two perspectives. There, there are two ways one can get to that position, either through legislation, which not everyone agrees to because it becomes draconian in some cases, but Roberto, to your point, that may be required. The other option is voluntary, is actually through altruism or through an ability to see that there is a mechanism of achieving sustainable buildings, better buildings, reuse existing, uh, which all includes uh, heritage conservation as well, and arriving at the realization that that is more sustainable. Uh, it's, it's retaining and uh, conserving the embodied energy that went into the original building, uh, conserving the, the carbon that is within that building. And there are demonstrations that it takes decades to recuperate any of that energy and carbon in the demolition of a building and the construction of a new building. So I think as architects, we have not done a good job in convincing building owners that there is an economic argument for conserving the existing building, whether it's a 50s modernist building or something that's two or 300 years old. There, there is still that strong argument. And the older the building, the, the larger the argument is, the more compelling. Yeah. Yeah, certainly on the energy side of things, the older a building is, uh, any retrofit that would be applied to it has a higher return because those buildings are more inefficient compared to more recent buildings from the 50s or, or, early, or more, more current. Uh, and to your point, Mark, uh, I think one of the biggest problems to helping us convince clients and uh, planners or politicians is that we need better metrics uh, to be able to assess embodied carbon in existing buildings. Because as soon as that becomes a parameter that you have to meet, same thing as meeting certain kilowatt hour usage for the building or uh, meeting costs or programmatic requirements, as soon as you loop in embodied carbon, that starts to reevaluate the value of the building from from a material building stock and and kind of material bank perspective. Yeah, I th I think we understand these issues intuitively, but as Eric suggests, I think we need some really good scientific um, research and evidence to begin to establish, make it easy to establish what the embodied carbon is in an existing building. So far, we don't seem to have that 
information and uh, as clearly as, as may be necessary to make the business case or make the uh, heritage case. The other thing I wanted to say um, about heritage buildings was that it, particularly maybe in smaller communities, often it's the heritage building which is uh, which are either you know the the town hall or the local church or whatever that are important in the collective consciousness of that community as landmarks as identifiers and uh, of their community. Um, so, for example, even in in Guelph, the the big Catholic church on the hill that we renovated, is is um, uh, a national historic site. So a lot of non um, religious people come to that church to see it for its value as a heritage structure. And even the local news uh, program, television news program, uh, in their opening credits does a flyby. So this is the, the iconic building that is associated with Guelph, much like the Eiffel Tower in Paris or you know, the CN Tower in Toronto. So um, it's, a, it's a matter of how we promote the value of these structures. Um, and acknowledge their value within the collective consciousness of communities. So you know, is this something we're failing at as a profession then or as a, as a sector, communicating that value? Or are there other things that are sort of getting, we're getting in our way some other way? Well, it's interesting in Calgary, being a relatively young city, heritage conservation in a lot of respects has been a very hard sell. Mm -hmm. However, there's a percentage of the population who are uh, agonized over the demolition of entire blocks of buildings from uh, 100 years ago or older. Others say, no, this is progress. This is uh, modernization. We need new buildings here. Uh, the iconic ones, though, are easier to save. It's the uh, more industrial or the less iconic or the less significant from a social or a cultural point of view. Whereas uh, uh, monuments of that type, like the, the Catholic Church or the Basilicas or the, uh, those significant uh, monuments and iconic within a community are, are easier to make an argument. But uh, in Calgary, we've lost wholesale districts, just completely gone. Uh, and sat as parking lots for decades until development uh, was, was uh, made economic sense. And uh, just to your point, Roberto, on uh, uh, embodied carbon, um, we were engaged uh, with by uh, LeMay uh, by the city of Calgary to do an analysis of heritage streets because there's a particular planner with the city of Calgary who's very much interested in conservation and conservation of heritage areas. So the, um, they did a similar um, study for residential areas. And in this case, Ian wanted to look at uh, commercial areas. So he engaged us to look at it from a triple bottom line point of view. And so we looked at the economics of the real estate within these areas. Uh, the other, one of the other aspects of the triple bottom line was the social value. And the third was the environmental value. We engaged Heritage Strategies International from Washington DC and they're a heritage firm uh, specializing in doing heritage analysis of heritage buildings and areas from a policy point of view. And make, they make recommendations to various municipalities as to what they could legislate in terms of policy or incentivize building owners to conserve their heritage building stock. And the, um, the, the means that we decided on uh, determining social value was through a, um, a willingness to pay survey. And uh, Donovan from Heritage Strategies commented that the World Bank and the United Nations use this strategy to, to try to monetize social value. So we did a, a survey of citizens of Calgary, determined that there was a, a high level of uh, recognition of the value of heritage areas and that they were willing to pay to conserve these areas. So that contributed to the argument. The other on the environmental side, uh, 
within the May, we, we have specialists who, and, uh, who deal strictly with uh, uh, embodied carbon. So uh, I asked that group to look at two heritage buildings in one of the districts in Calgary and started to uh, put together what, what that embodied carbon value would be. So we could start to monetize and put all the numbers together. And uh, city is, as far as we understand, this is a little bit groundbreaking in North America. Uh, Donovan in Washington isn't aware of a similar um, example where there was a triple bottom line valuation of uh, heritage buildings and heritage areas. So it's all looking very promising. Uh, just last week, we recorded a bit for the National Trust coming up, the, the conference. And so everyone on this call and anyone who tunes into that will be able to see it. We just completed the first phase and the actual policy and uh, legislation will come about in, in the second phase over this next year. So that might be encouraging for other municipalities or other building owners to start looking at that triple bottom line basis for and, and I, I think it can lead to a strong argument for heritage conservation. Uh, so we're happy to, to share any of that experience uh, as, as we get closer to the end goal. I, yes. I think Mark, if, I, if I just pipe in quickly, I think that, that you raise a really interesting point about um, certainly conservation is often pitted against um, metrics. And the metrics that we're pitted against are measurable. So if we're talking about energy consumption, for example, or, um, or uh, you know, whatever, uh, you know, economic from a perspective, but they're not, the, the metrics of the actual value of a building are have always been much harder to quantify. So it's sort of going with what's often seen as somebody's opinion, which is often the, oh, it's, you know, heritage is sort of, as, as the person who's doing the review defines it, even though we all know that's not true, that's sort of the perception versus an actual metric. And that's a, often a losing battle from a heritage perspective because we're not able to quantify the value of the building. So it's a very interesting argument um, to be able to quantify its social value. Um, but in terms of the embodied energy, just to raise a point, the Climate Heritage Network is in the process of building tools to be able to calculate embodied energy and to include that as part of the, um, to, to create those tools. They're, they're you know, at the beginning, but I think it's one of the major objectives and a key, um, a key part of it. Um, but also I think there's a false perception, maybe, to, maybe Mark, you can speak to a point Eric raised is that, because I, I did take Mark's um, AAA course when I went to go license in Alberta. So, so there was, what really struck me about that course was a series of analysis of um, some existing buildings that were masonry and their um, cumulative or um, effective R, R value was around R4 or R5 or R4 maybe even. But then they did a comparison to a modern skyscraper and it's R3 as its effective value. So there is kind of a myth as well that of how good our new buildings are versus how bad our existing buildings are too, which I think is, a, a, is, um, is also something that's very pervasive and um, that we need to think about as well. Well, absolutely. And this has been is such a huge irony and it borders on a tragedy actually. Uh, a giant skyscraper, which is 90% glazing, the spandrel panels may have achieved an R20 insulation value, but that's 10% of the surface of the building. 90% achieved R2 in terms of double glazed unit. So the overall R value would be R3 at, maybe at best. Now, something uh, just recent is a uh, change in legislation where the 100% curtain wall is not as feasible as it once was because it cannot achieve the, uh, the new requirements for the National Energy Code unless they go to triple or quadruple glazing and, and other techniques. So I think uh, our argument may be less uh, challenging going forward 
as there is a certain amount of legislation introduced. But uh, that no, that's an excellent point. And to Eric's point, if the we may not be able to improve the overall insulation value, say, of a mass masonry building, but we can improve air leakage, we can improve uh, through windows and ceilings and so on. We can improve mechanical systems and uh, lighting and all kinds of other things which uh, contribute to a more sustainable heritage building. Mm -hmm. Certainly, yeah. and, and to that point on uh, insulating 19th century or, or early 20th century structures, if one were to approach it, there are ways of doing it, but it has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. It can't be a blanket method. Every building has its own conditions, but uh, it's not a hopeless prop uh, proposition to suggest that once all that low-hanging fruit, like insulating the roof and changing of the windows and all that has been done, that you uh, once all of that has been taken care of and you try to reduce air infiltration as much as possible, that including an interior insulation retrofit is not out of the question in, in certain situations. And there are different uh, approaches that could be uh, utilized depending on the climate or the type of masonry or the thickness of it and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, um, I, mean, I would encourage you to attend our session. Eric and I um, um, presented uh, along with others, uh, some pretty compelling um, uh, solutions to uh, improving energy efficiencies of heritage buildings that don't uh, accelerate the deterioration of things like mass wall uh, masonry. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there are there's a considerable amount of research being put into that. Um, just one other thing I wanted to say, I keep coming back to, my, my, my interest is always in the big picture. And I think I recently heard, I think it was Alberto Perez Gomez, say that uh, design is a worldview activity. So um, I think in a way, maybe, um, well, first of all, obviously worldview is really important. And I think we need to shift the pervasive Western worldview of progress uh, in order to achieve that viable future. Um, but uh, I also think that in a way, climate change as horrifying as it is, will hopefully accelerate a shift in worldview towards uh, values that uh, recognize uh, heritage buildings um, on many, many levels, including their ability as resilient buildings. Often these old heritage mass wall stone and, and brick buildings have a lot more resilience than uh, modern frame structures you know, against hurricanes, flooding, uh, fire, all those kinds of uh, elements. Yes, uh, along with resiliency in terms of economic adaptability as well, because we see so many of these types of buildings getting repurposed, whether mm -hmm. it's uh, masonry warehouse buildings being used for residential or uh, the value, the economic value and return on retrofitting a warehouse building to office use, uh, as opposed to building, let's say a brand new mass timber wood building. Why are we demolishing existing mass uh, timber brick and beam buildings and just saving the facades? All right, exactly. Uh, there are a number of real estate uh, investment trusts in Canada who, whose major portfolio are heritage buildings. And uh, I've had chats with, with uh, some of these folks and there is uh, a very low vacancy rate. There's a high tenancy, very, um, whether it's a commercial or an office use, if it's commercial, there tends to be uh, more patrons, uh, that there's a desirability to do business with, with uh, people who reside in these heritage buildings. There's a tremendous amount of character, generally higher ceilings, uh, large windows, so a great deal of natural light. Uh, so there, yeah, there's strong arguments. And the study that we're currently involved in with the city of Calgary has demonstrated that there is a premium in terms of uh, overall economic 
value. So uh, assessed value of the building, but also of um, adjacent buildings. So whether it's a heritage building within a heritage area or a new building within or proximal to a heritage area, there is uh, an in increase in, in its actual economic value. So th that was uh, quite surprising. And we had Altus Group do that uh, um, multiple regression analysis to determine that one factor. And it was really encouraging to see that there is a significant premium uh, that people are actually do pay for heritage buildings. Sounds like we're, we're starting to wade into uh, our fourth question. Um, major current opportunities for our industry to improve sustainable practice. I think Mark's just touched on uh, one major opportunity. wonder if Eric well, just, oh, just a bit further on that is that uh, the, the planner we're working with at the City of Calgary has made the comment a number of times that City Council only understands economics. They're not concerned. There might be one or two older uh, councillors who have an affinity for heritage buildings, but overall it's all about economics. So that was the strong rationale for monetizing this triple bottom line value. I think the, the my critique of our uh, current economic uh, considerations or economic equations is, is that we treat things like social justice, pollution, um, climate change, uh, or effects, impacts of our buildings on climate change or economic uh, processes as externalities. So we need to really uh, <laughs> no longer consider them as, as not affecting the bottom line, but ultimately very much affecting the bottom line. And so um, to Mark's point, uh, the business cases or economic decisions uh, for municipalities or you know, those uh, legislators having jurisdiction really need to consider that. And I think as we begin to see the financial implications of climate change, like the billions and billions of dollars of damage that occur due to hurricanes in the United States or forced fires and et cetera, um, I, I'm hopeful that the worldview will begin to shift and understand those externalities as absolutely critical to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly from a legislative point of view, uh, I know we brought this up with with Dima a few days ago in terms of putting together a, a federal uh, national policy with regard to existing buildings. Because if we look only at heritage, every province in the country falls under its own jurisdictional act. And that can get pretty easily gutted with the right provincial government in play. Um, where it's easier to demolish a building than it is to save it or get it designated. Uh, and I think we need to advocate uh, politically. And I think just in a few weeks, we'll be able to do that uh, firsthand uh, to try to push for some kind of national policy with regard to energy efficiency in existing buildings and not just what the building code mandates for new construction. So for example, um, the city of Toronto has just um, developed uh, and uh, adopted a strategy. So for all buildings in the city of Toronto to be net zero emissions by 2050. And um, so there's a, you know, this is kind of like a, a phased in implementation, starting with voluntary moving towards mandatory, mandatory requirements. So what that means is that obviously there's gonna to have to be um, um, cooperation with different levels of government. There's gonna to have to be huge financial incentives uh, made available. And um, so hopefully um, all of these things will begin to fall into alignment with each other to achieve those goals. Otherwise we don't have a hope and, uh, you know, to, um, to achieve that. Robert, I have a question about that because one of the concerns certainly that um, prompted actually these talks and prompted um, some of the work we're doing with Theodora earlier um, last year and with Ecomos is it was a concern that um, 
you know, when the infrastructure, green infrastructure funding came out, there was no mention of heritage. There was no mention of existing buildings. Um, there was a very high focus on operational, on net zero, and there was no real um, accountability for um, sort of what you mentioned before, which would be the supply chain energy. So the energy it costs to make all the materials or transport them to a site to build it all. And our concern was that um, if that's the level of discourse and where the discussions remained, um, that, uh, that it, it's going to support an argument for demolishing heritage buildings because they're so and so so called energy inefficient. We you know not recognizing how any often and new buildings are more energy efficient, but and that um, we needed to actually change that voice. So I'm just curious, since I know you participated in those discussions with the city um, of Toronto, do they have a built in recognition of embodied energy so that we're not we're not overly um, overly like you know being overly nice to new buildings ignoring the energy costs to build them and over penalizing old buildings by ignoring their embodied energy well the strategy uh includes every building whether new or existing so you know i live in an 1887 row house in you know uh, an older part of toronto and what it means is that before 2050, at some point, I will have to change out my gas fired furnace and hot water heater with an electric heat pump. Um, and so, um, or, you know, improve the insulation values in my house or, or whatever. I mean, we're, we're, it's pretty efficient because I'm in a row house, the middle of three. So, so I, <laughs> you know, I get to benefit from my neighbor's heating systems as well. But, um, you know, I, and I presume the reason why it goes to 2050 is that, you know, I know that the furnace I just replaced, which is the most highly high efficient, you know, DC motor, whatever variable speed furnace I could get, uh, will probably have a shelf life or an active service life of about 20 years. So I, I can defer that decision, financial decision, unless incentives uh, you know, then we also have to talk about the embodied energy within that existing furnace and the, the embodied energy in the new furnace. And it, it becomes a very, very complex uh, conversation. It's not that simple. If I could just uh, say, so oh, sorry, Eric, did you want to say something? Oh, no, go ahead, Theodora. Okay, just because in my previous life, I was a city councillor, so I just uh, <laughs> I'm curious to uh, <laughs> to just interject the opinion, and it's uh, um, it's a bit worrisome to see that you know, as politicians, you want to make these grandiose you know gestures, right? And the worry I have with a mandatory oh, can you hear me? Am I okay? Yeah. No. Okay. Putting a 2050 net zero kind of, you know, line in the ground is okay for cars, let's say, right? Because ultimately they'll have run their life and then you dispose of them and you will get an electric car. But the worry with the buildings is that, again, we won't be looking at them. Again, you're not gonna be looking at apples and apples. We'll be looking at apples and oranges and the energy efficiency requirements of a heritage home or even a 1950s structure to Eric's point, right? It's not the older homes too, it's the ones that are kind of in between in the 50s and 60s. I fear too that cities may very well turn to demolition because the requirement will be, and the bar will be not the same and shouldn't be the same in some ways for new construction versus existing construction. So I just, it's an interesting thing that Toronto is doing. And I'm just not sure to your point, it's a very complicated uh, calculation that's gonna happen afterwards. And I think as, uh, one of the challenges we're going to have moving forward is again to maybe sensitize and educate about the need to consider a different calculus because I fear too that you're going to end up demolishing things that are just not going to make it. You know, 2050 is going to come along. I don't think it's going to happen automatically, but um, it's an interesting um, development. Let's just say that in right. terms of that. And I just want I might offer in terms of a, a political incentive that 
single family homes, which make up the majority of the built environment in Canadian urban centers, offer the single largest opportunity to helping reduce energy loads. Because if you consider the cost of retrofitting or trying to get a, a mid or like 12 to 15 story office building down to net zero, uh, and get your energy use down to about 75 kilowatt hours, which is kind of the minimum benchmark for a building of that size. Uh, the going uh, formula for achieving net zero at a 75 kilowatt per meter squared is half your GFA is the size of your solar array. So the larger your GFA of a building, the larger your solar array you would have to apply and on a small site in an urban core, you might not be able to have that on a rooftop or the solar exposure to do it. So the smaller a building, like a house, you might be able to achieve that on your exposed roof areas. Uh, and through the process of uh, installing installation and improving air infiltration and energy leaks uh, through the envelope and achieving uh, or getting your heating loads and, and energy loads down to that 75 kilowatt hour per meter squared, you may be able to achieve net zero more easily on, on these types of single family structures. So is it then possible to meet our housing needs and our climate goals, if that's the case? I, I think there's a very fine line because we don't want to encourage sprawl through more single family dwelling, we want to encourage density. I think we need to find that, that sweet spot in between low density sprawl and, and high rise uh, urban uh, intensification, that kind of missing middle that we're always talking about, six story or six to 10 story buildings might be uh, the greatest, uh, the largest solution that we're not fully uh, being able to realize because that's the, size of building that we can also do in mass timber now instead of concrete or steel uh, and increasingly taller buildings out of mass uh, timber that, that will be able to incorporate more embodied carbon. Or, or even just zoning that allows for duplexes or triplexes or row houses in single family neighborhoods. We don't even have to go up high. I mean, currently, so much of the zoning in residential is only for single family and you're not allowed to do anything else. So even something that allows like a densification on a traditional single family lot too is not allowed mm -hmm. in a lot of places. So that's yeah. also a huge right. change. Yeah, whether we're talking about, you know, laneway housing or adding a unit in your basement that meets zoning, you know, or zoning is revised to allow for that. Um, all of those are really excellent strategies, I think, that, that should be picked up by planners. Well, I, I think they should be, even here in Calgary, where it's, as I mentioned, a relatively young city. There are established communities where residents may have been in the community for decades, recognize it as uh, having heritage value based on its planning, um, its layout, its... Uh, continuous streetscapes of similar scaled houses. And to Eric's point, improving the sustainability or energy efficiency of these houses can be really quite easily done. Um, and it may encourage incentives or it may just be uh, uh, mandated, uh, legislated. Um, but I think the heritage character of, of those communities can be retained by laneway housing or adding a secondary suite. And uh, I sit on a, a board, Jack Long Foundation, which is uh, essentially housing for the elderly and aging in place. So the elderly don't have to leave their community. Um, and this could be a very uh, feasible way of maintaining the heritage character of a community, improving the energy efficiency of a building, but also adding a suite or a laneway house, which would uh, incentivize and provide uh, economic uh, um, viability for the people staying in their property. So I think there could be wins on all sides, but again, it's one of those, what are planners and what are politicians and what are residents, citizens of the community uh, able to ag agree to? 
I think I think Tom brings up a very good point in terms of designated districts, uh, heritage conservation districts. Do they po pose any obstacles to retrofits or creating the densities that we need to accommodate the growth that we're expected to see in cities? Uh, certainly, I know of some examples in Toronto, uh, like areas like Cabbage Town in the north, uh, uh, the north east corner of the city that they any kind of change to an existing heritage home is, is considered sacrosanct to the integrity of the district but uh, to the same effect I think uh, as much as we want to try to encourage retrofits and and retention of as many existing buildings as we can these types of designations also have to be able to adapt with the times we can't just say that every single building that is a mass masonry wall, um, yes, you wanna be able to see it from the outside, see that brick, um, but we can't have the policies such that it will restrict the ability to adapt these buildings to ensure that they will continue to serve their functions in the long term. Maybe on that uh, point, we'll we'll pause and we'll move into breakout rooms so that everyone else can get a chance to, you know, now that we've got all these ideas flowing. Um, so either it'll pop up or you'll have to click on the breakout rooms bottom at the bottom of your screen and then you can decide which of the two, I believe we've got two breakout rooms. Um, you can click on join for the opportunities and obstacles or for the needs and failings and you can um, click on either of those rooms, depending on your preference and what you're feeling like chatting. Okay, well, maybe before we close the session, um, I'll give each of the panelists, let's see, have we got Mark back? Everyone's moved around on the screen. So we'll start with uh, maybe Eric, if you wanna share your one sort of takeaway from today's session, um, just a sort of closing thought from you and then, uh, I'll, I'll give you I'll cut you off after two minutes though <laughs> well I don't know if I'll take up all two minutes because I'll <laughs> I'll leave some space for Mark and Roberto as well but certainly based on the conversations uh, there's inherent value in our existing building stock and we are all working in this in this specialization of the the building trade because we have a connection with the past and all of our existing buildings share our collective story so if we lose all of that we lose a part of our history and our culture um, so this is what we're trying to retain and from what i've been hearing in the breakout rooms and part of the other discussions that we've had uh, among the panelists is we need tools available to really start to put numbers behind uh, some way of evaluating our existing buildings uh, whether that's through embodied energy and embodied carbon, this has to become part of the, uh, the metrics that we evaluate sites for, not just cultural and uh, contextual and associative value, but that environmental value in, in the actual uh, material bank that these buildings contain. Um, so I know there's lots of research uh, starting to emerge in this area. We need to see a lot more of it. We need to Kind of be pushing it within our own practices and firms so uh, we know we need to start sharing it in in some kind of uh forum as well uh so that everyone can benefit and learn from it thanks eric robert i'll give you that same two minutes to give your your closing thoughts from today your takeaways okay well i'm actually really encouraged um both by the number of participants in in the kind of research that's being undertaken by people like Mark and Eric and building science. And uh, as somebody who uh, has a degree in theology and ecology, uh, to me, heritage and sustainability are one and the same. I mean, I really don't think you can have one conversation without the other. So I am uh, encouraged by that. And uh, I really hope that all of us um, take up the call to action to um, really promote and uh, contribute towards, um, you know, the case to um, save and retrofit and renovate and make more sustainable our existing built environment, particularly our heritage. Thanks, Thanks Roberto. Um, Mark, I'll give you that same two minutes for your, your takeaway. 
All right, thank you. I would like to echo comments from, by Roberto and Eric and, and others in the, uh, in the chat rooms. Uh, it's very encouraging to see we're facing similar challenges across the country. And uh, I think if we share ideas, we can address them in a holistic and unif uh, unified kind of fashion. Um, it's, and it's very encouraging to see heritage conservation uh, with its twin of sustainability because I think they were separated for most of my career, but the fact that they are recognized as contributing to one another and inextricably linked. Um, and as Roberto mentioned, the externalities must form a part of the uh, economic bottom line. And um, that was, I've always found through my career that that was very frustrating that uh, the single bottom line drove development uh, to the detriment of uh, our communities from a social point of view, as well as the environment. Um, so I think we're, we're heading in the right direction. As I've always said to my students, if you're not a leader, you're a follower, then a client doesn't want you. They want someone who knows more than they do. And there's some really sophisticated clients out there. So we, we need to be uh, partners with people who have the same kind of vision. And uh, we're constantly looking for people who, who have that vision uh, for heritage conservation. I think it's a, it, there's a tremendous future in it. Wonderful, thanks, Mark. Um, so as we're closing, I'm just gonna remind everyone that this is the second in a weekly series of events. Uh, we'll have another, uh, another session next Thursday, 1230 Eastern, um, where we'll be focusing on engineering. And then the week after that, we'll be looking at trades. And this will all culminate in a discussion paper and a session at the National Trust Conference. Um, just a quick reminder, in case you haven't heard, the uh, early bird registration be. Um, I, I believe next week it ends. So um, if you're planning on registering, um, then the, the fees do go up next week. Um, but we really appreciate everyone coming out this, out this week. And we hope we'll see you again at our next two events and hopefully at the final event as well, which we'll be able to share with CAP members who aren't attending the conference. So um, you will be able to attend that fifth event as well. Um, a huge thank you to Roberto, Eric, uh, Mark and to Dima as well, who's <laughs> struggling with her voice today. I really appreciate all of you being on the panel. And um, again, thank you to everyone for coming out. Uh, these discussions, I think, are very helpful for us. And I'm really glad that everyone came out and participated today. And I hope to see your faces again in the next couple of weeks. Have a good rest of the day, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mark, Eric, Dima. Thank you. We'll try it again. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.